This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. With a loss of connection to one of nature's most powerful rhythms, women may lose the sense of balance within themselves, their relationships, and their world. Valeria Tellez interviews Pia Orlean and Cullen Smith on the book, Sacred Retreat, Using Natural Cycles to Recharge Your Life. Pia Orlean, PhD, and Cullen Baird Smith are ambassadors to the Pleiadian group Larkma, these interstellar beings have been working with Pia and Cullen to assist humans heal from all that is out of balance in humanity. Their second book, Remembering Who We Are, Larkma's Guidance on Healing the Human Condition, specifically addresses healing. Trained in archaeology and anthropology, Cullen Baird Smith is an empathic intuitive who has been accessing parallel realms of love and light since childhood. He is co-author with Pia Orlean of the COVR award-winning book, Pleiadian Earth Energy Astrology, Charting the Spirals of Consciousness, Conversations with Larkma, A Pleiadian View of the New Reality, and Remembering Who We Are, Larkma's Guidance on Healing the Human Condition. Pia Orlean, PhD, is a former practicing psychologist, a respected intuitive, astrologer, and the author of the Nautilus Gold award-winning book, Sacred Retreat, Using Natural Cycles to Recharge Your Life. She is co-author with Cullen Baird Smith of the Wisdom from the Stars series. Cullen and Pia are also co-creators of the revolutionary 2020 Pleiadian Earth Energy Calendar. They live in Europe. Meet Pia and Cullen at larkma.com. Here is the interview with Pia Orlean, and Cullen Smith. In your own words, who is Dr. Pia Orlean and Cullen Smith? Pia, I apologize for not announcing you for the last two times we spoke. You are a doctor. So the label I forgot to mention for some reason. So today I thought about it. Thank you, Valeria. I am someone who has been trained in alternative medicine and a researcher in regular Western medicine. I have been a clinical psychologist for most of my career. I'm an author and I bring in a lot of wisdom from other realms to help people get a larger perspective. Yes, beautifully done. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Cullen Smith, and I've been interested in alternative medicine and ways that that we humans can rebalance ourselves and come back into the natural cycles of nature, which we are absolutely part of. So I've been involved with energy medicine, alternative medicine, and healing in many different levels in many different ways all of my life, starting as a small child, when I realized that I could help people simply by touching them and talking with them. Today we are talking about cycles and transformation, renewal, change. So my first question to both of you is, what is life and what is death and what is the balance between them? Oh, what a wonderful question. I see life and death as a swinging door between different states of consciousness and different experience. I don't see death as an end point. I don't see it as anything other than a change of perspective and a change of experience. 
Life is consciousness. Death is also consciousness, but in a different form. What we are doing here in our living experience is gathering various experiences together to raise our consciousness so the distinction between life and death is not so big any longer. Colin, would you like to add? Well, I, I would certainly agree with what Pia just said. Once again, life and death is a balance. It It is understanding that we experience both of those things, but most people's perception in our species as humans is that death is the end of life. Right. And it's not the end of life. It's only a change of life. All it is is changing the energy, as Pia said, of the form that we experience ourselves and everything else in the universe in. So what what we do is do our best to live life as fully as we can and realize that when it's time for the body to finish its adventure here on planet Earth, we simply go into another form. We go into another consciousness, as Pia said, and we continue to grow and learn. Everything you say resonates with me. My entire being. And with that in mind, I know that some of the way we speak and the way we express ourselves in this reality sometimes comes from belief systems. And I try to always ask the question recently for some reason, when did this wisdom or this understanding move from a place of belief to knowing, if it ever did, if it wasn't always for you, always a knowing perhaps? I think most people have a belief system about life and death. I can say that all of my life I have been aware that there is another experience that I am a part of that's larger than my earthly experience. And I can add to that to say that in this current lifetime, I have died technically. I have been legally considered brain dead for a very long period of time, more than once. And that experience gave me a magnificent opportunity to verify what I knew internally from a small child, that there is no difference. Our consciousness is still very much alive, even when we move into a different state of being. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's been a knowing always. Would you like to add, Colin? Well, I, I would say that Pia and I, upon coming to this plane of existence here on earth as humans, we never forgot what we knew before we arrived here. And so I think our perspective and understanding of death has been quite different from our childhoods. I think we weren't in that illusionary idea space of, well, we're going to live for a certain amount of time and then we're going to die and we're going to lose everything we have because of going through the death process. Pia and I have realized since childhood that it's just a process that goes on and on and on. And we don't have to fear the change because the change only brings us something new. What is the difference? What makes some human beings to embody here with this remembrance, with this spiritual innate, let's say, wisdom. What happens in the after death if we had many lives? Well, here on Earth, we are living in an illusion. And I think it's very easy for people to get attached to illusion of what they believe to be real. And there's a sleepy forgetfulness about what they remembered when they were born, as they came in. Our educational system, our religious system, our family, tribal systems, all of the systems that we operate in on a daily base, are, all of them point to this is real, this is the structure, this is what you have to believe in. So there is a gradual that forgetting that most people involve themselves in. Cullen and I just never forgot. Wow, so in a way, you're never exposed to these illusory ideas and concepts, or it's something that you chose to hold on to, to that remembrance? Y yes, um, I, I think we were exposed to many of these systems that Pia described, 
many, many of these organized ways of, of teaching people what they need to know or what someone believes is more important to know. But what happened to us as children is we realized what we were being told simply wasn't the truth. We rejected almost everything that we were told through society, education, ancestry. I could go on and on about why Pia and I simply were able as small children to say, no, that's really not reality for us. So I think we sidestepped most of the training, which I have called and I've written about over the years, bad training. I think we were able to see a much bigger reality, a much bigger scope of cosmic understanding. And so we never really believed most of what we were being told. And I would add to that, yeah. we were supported by not believing it because we have both of us since childhood had communications with other realms. And communicating regularly with other realms, they they indicate to you, they help you understand, yes, what you're seeing and remembering is true and what you're being taught is not true. So we've had a lot of support with holding on to what we knew was real. And how did you navigate through these challenges, through these uh, ideas from society and family? <laughs> yeah, because for me, has been it still is a challenge. <laughs> well, there was a whole lot of crying and yelling, and I'm going to run away from. <laughs> I was a little girl. I can, tell you. <laughs> I can imagine, Pia. Oh my God. <laughs> there was resistance um, from from some places, from some people, some organizations. But I have to say, in my case, my parents were very understanding. They were very supportive. And they they didn't try to tell me things were correct or real that, that I said, I'm sorry, but I simply don't believe in this. They were open-minded enough to tell me that it's okay for you to have alternate ideas because maybe your ideas are just as important as the ideas that society is telling you that you must believe in. So in, in my case, I had great support um, all along from the very beginning. So before I ask you lots of questions about your book, Sacred Retreat, let me ask you one more question, warm up question. What is to be a woman and what is to be a man from your perspective? Ah, oh, that's an interesting one. Colin and I equally believe that each of us is an androgynous being, and we take on the clothing of being a female or being a male when we come into this incarnation. However, within us, we have a male part and we have a female part, each of us in balance. So you will see many, many women who act very, very masculine, have a lot of masculine traits, and many, many men who have a lot of feminine traits. And that's just their own inner masculine or their inner feminine tipping the balance. So it's not balanced in harmony. Most people fall into the illusion of this is the role of what it is to be a woman. So therefore I have to be this, 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 and this, and not be this, 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 and this. And it varies from culture to culture. In Western society, being a woman has meant that we are the softer, that we are the caretakers, that we are the ones who are intuitive, that we're more emotional, that we're unreliable, that we can't function every 30 days. We have a non-functioning period of our lives that we can't work as normal. There have been a lot of roles that have been cast upon being a female. But now the pendulum has swung the other way. And now what I see is to use one of Cullen's terms, I see an awful lot of women in training to be men. Rather than accepting their natural balance of feminine gifts and the masculine that lives naturally within them, they throw out all their feminine attributes and try to be everything that society says they like in a man. So they become more aggressive, more competitive. They do many, many things that are out of harmony with their true nature. So... I think it's really important for all of us to recognize that culture and society should not dictate what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a man. What should dictate that are the divine masculine attributes and the divine feminine attributes that live within each of us and are making conscious choice of which ones we want to utilize at any point in time. And that makes me think about what would that look like 
this balance, which I am talking to it now, but in a way for us like who live out there in the world and among a lot of people who are imbalanced, talk to me for a moment about what that looks like and feels like from your perspective. From my perspective, that balance, it still has more of the attributes of the feminine. It's softer, it's kinder, it's, yeah. I would agree with you, Valeria, and I think that's because the matriarchal culture Mm -hmm. and the divine feminine attributes are inclusive. They are cooperative. They reach out and they include the male within the matriarchal idea of what is wholeness, whereas matriarchal culture excludes the feminine and says it's no good. So there's a complete diversion between the two perspectives. And there's something there's something going on in the evolution of our species at this time. I'm not quite sure why it's happening. I have theories about it, but in this short interview, I, I can't really describe many of them. But I would say that there is a rebalancing of the divine feminine that has been lost for eons, for thousands of years, the the male dominance against nature, against the, the, the highest, most divine aspects of the divine feminine, something is happening and there is a rebalancing taking place. And men are on average waking up for some reason at this point to understand that that balance between male and female is exactly what has to happen in order to return ourselves not only to balance but to understand that we are part of nature and that if we work within natural cycles we will rebalance not only ourselves as genders as male and female but we will rebalance the earth also because it's time that a balance and a harmony takes place because we've done too much damage to ourselves and the earth. And it's time that we do something very seriously changing about that. One of the keys for finding balance, which you ask, what would it look like? One of the keys for finding that balance is learning to be responsive to circumstances rather than reactive. Mm. We are so... In a fast society, we are so quick to react to something without taking a breath in and truly evaluating what's going on and what's needed. And that is an emotional response. It's a knee-jerk response to enter into an old pattern Mm -hmm. that may not be beneficial for dealing with whatever the circumstance may be. So one of the most important things we have to do is to learn to utilize our emotions as pointing out why we're out of balance. Why am I so emotional about this? What is it about this that's upsetting me? Take a breath in, think about what we're thinking and our perspective, and then maybe reorganize our thoughts to think in a more holistic way. And I have a question for you about this balanced, um, harmonious, let's say, state of being on earth. Did that ever exist? In my opinion, it did. I think absolutely. I think in ancient times, before many control situations began, there are are many examples of of how things changed. About 10,000 years ago, historically, the idea of food and food being available to everybody changed. Food was actually locked up by those who felt they were in power so that they could cause people to do things or change things in a way that wasn't in a natural situation where people could just gather food normally. People began storing food and that's when the domestication of animals happened. And the whole program or the whole process of people being able to eat freely changed overnight. And that was one of the beginning situations of how control 
and manipulation took place in our societies. The other thing that has caused us to tip badly out of balance is our dysregulation from Earth's rhythms. When the electric light was invented, all of a sudden we decided that it was a good idea to stay up past when the sun went down. And so we disconnected from Earth's natural rhythms by an artificial sense of timing. And since that initial disconnect right there, we have been thrown off with our natural rhythms them in harmony with earth. So we cannot be internally balanced when we're not balanced with the rhythms of our own planet. This idea of balance is so interesting because it feels to me like we are always moving in and out of balance. And we see at one time you have the, the feminine energy dominates and then the masculine. And then and that's why I asked the question, if we ever got to that point of coming to balance all of us on earth because it feels to me like it's a movement. There's no center point. There's no center. It's always dancing. But it's important to learn how to dance with those cycles, right, Pia and Colin? I think there is a dance, but I wouldn't say there's not a center point. Mm -hmm. I would say the center point is the heart. Mm -hmm. If you watch two tango dancers, even though it's a very passionate dance and one is representing a male and one is representing a female, they move as one. So I think the dance you're talking about and the dance we're seeking is to be able to be in the center point in our heart and vacillate between the changing energies and the movements that we need to make moment by moment. Mm. Yes. I think, I yeah. think ab aboriginal societies, both ancient and modern, were able to work with that balance between male and female and the earth herself. And I, I think there are still vestiges of groups around this world who are still in balance with each other, where the women in, in the, the tribal groups are respected by the men, and the men often allow, and I'm, I'm not sure saying allow is a good term, but the, but the men listen to the women as though they are equals, and they make decisions together instead of a male dominant decision-making process. So I think there was balance in, in earlier times in our societies in a, in a much greater way between the genders. So talk to me about the inspiration and the purpose of writing your book, Sacred Retreat, Using Natural Cycles to Recharge Your Life. Well, the purpose of the book came out of my own experience of being a woman who was dismissed because women in my age and my when I was growing up were very much dismissed on almost every level. Our opinions didn't matter. You hid having a cycle every month. It was embarrassing. All of those things were completely out of alignment with harmony as far as I was concerned. And I happened to cross some Native American women who explained to me the process of honoring the cycle as a ceremony and how it was a time of purging and cleansing not only the menstrual blood that came out every month if a baby wasn't created, but also all the negative emotions, feelings, arguments, anything that month that had happened that was you don't want to hold on to any longer, honoring the cycle as a ceremony and being able to purge all that at one time brought more harmony to the family and to the tribe. And I decided that was a really wonderful thing to experiment with. So I set up my own sacred space where I would go into a retreat and meditate and read and color and write, and do whatever I wanted to do during my cycle, and then go back to my normal life afterwards. I was in a position that I could do that. And I did. And what I noticed was everything in my life improved. Mm -hmm. So I decided to investigate a psychological study of this with a group of women across the nation. And I had them investigate four different areas, the area of their um, spiritual or intuition, if it improved, the area of their relationship harmony, if it improved, the area of their dreams, if that improved, and their health, if that improved. I had everything categorized in four different categories if they were in the position to set up a sacred space and withdraw into it once a month. The only caveat for this particular 
experiment was that if they were married, they had to have, or in a partnership, their partners had to support the experiment. And what happened was I got statistically high resonance in all four areas. It was called statistical significance, saying that the positive effects were not just due to chance. The positive effects were definitely aligned to the practice of sleeping separately and going into a sacred space during the menstrual cycle. That study was honored by the university I was in at the time, who gave me a grant and said, turn this into a book. And that's where the book came from. The book came from, how can I make a contribution to society where women and men both recognize the sacredness of the cycles that we have? We have, every part of being a human includes a cycle of some sort. We have 300 billion cells that we produce all the time. We have more than 17,000 breaths every day, an average of 30,000 blinks of the eye every day. These are cycles that make us human, and we ignore them or don't think about them. And to actually become conscious of them as a male or a female and say, how can I honor this and be in harmony with it creates a better lifestyle for all of us. I noticed that most of us, me included, tend to pay attention more to the sun or want to be in the sun more than actually enjoying the moonlight, being in the nighttime, just paying attention to the moon. Do you think that this is also part of this um, conditioned society and planted ideas that we have adopted? I think it's a patriarchal value because the patriarchy aligns with the sun. It's light, it's progress, it's forward movement. And the moon aligns with the neck, with the uh, the attributes of being feminine. It's the receptive, it's the quiet, it's the nurturing, it's the dark, it's the place where we go into ourselves and allow the seed of creativity to sprout. And then if you put the sun and the moon together, you've got perfect balance. It's a yin-yang symbol of perfect balance, but we need both. So your book, the title, really, I love the title, Sacred Retreat. It kind of the moon came into my vision. Just I saw the moon symbol. This is in your book, but I dreamt about it and just it's present a lot more. I have a lot of quotes here from your book that I love. This one that says, movement is implicit in nature's cycles because motion promotes change. And this is under the... Uh, Chaos theory. So I'd love to hear about that more. Chaos theory, when people hear the word chaos, they think that that is out of order. But actually, chaos means that there's an implicate order that cannot be seen. It is a movement that is bringing everything into harmony continually. So the chaos theory is all about recognizing that even if you can't see how the order is unfolding, the universe knows exactly what it's doing. So therefore, if we stay present in the present moment and respond to the energies as they present themselves, we're not living in chaos. We're living in a movement that is moving us towards harmony. It's almost like a a song listening to you both. (laughs) <laughs> it really, it is. It is this, um, there's harmony. So you represent that. That's beautiful. Thank you. So the idea of consistent or constancy being normal, that's another, it's a chapter two, biology and healing. And you speak of that. And I wonder, if this is not normal. It's actually a word that I don't use. I love the word natural more than normal. You write, the divine feminine presence is urging us to listen to our hearts and return to our, a participation with nature rather than trying to control her. For women, Pia, are we trying to control the menstruation and that cycle? Because I never tried myself, but I see my own husband, um, he tries to control in a sense of bothers him that change every month before, during, and after. I would love to hear from you about what to do in this situation. Like in my case, I don't want to defend myself because there's nothing to defend. It's nature, being nature. How do you advise us? What do you suggest us to do? Well, I would suggest that we educate the men 
And sometimes that starts with educating children so they don't grow up with the wrong idea. But we need to educate the men that the idea of having a cycle is something that is magical. It's an opportunity to withdraw into ourselves and clear out everything that's out of balance. And then from that space, create something better. If we can educate men to what that is and how that works, they might get a little curious themselves about, well, hmm, maybe I'd like to do something like that too. That's what Native American um, sweat lodges are about, giving the men the opportunity to withdraw, get quiet, purge, cleanse, reorganize, and come out with a creative idea. I think it's exceedingly important for men to begin to understand, and this is an important thought, whether they understand what women are all about or what they're going through in their cycles, it's it's time for men to give women the respect of what they're going through and what their needs are Instead of men thinking, oh, this is interrupting my lifestyle or this is interrupting what I want in life, what men have to do, and, I, and I'm talking about balanced men here, they, they need to begin to be more compassionate and more understanding and more supportive of women during their cycle changes. Instead of thinking, as I said a moment ago, about, oh, here this is again and, and it bothers me or I don't understand it. They need to change their attitude or their perspective and simply realize that this is part of nature and this is something that does happen. It's purposeful. And I think that's a key point. The menstrual cycle is purposeful in life. There's a really key difference between Western society's perspective of the way men treat menstrual cycles and the indigenous perspective worldwide. And I studied this globally when I was writing this book and doing my research. In the Western society, if a woman gets emotional about something that she doesn't like that's going on in her life, or she's upset about something during her period, a man will often say, oh, you're just emotional because it's your period. It's just your hormone. What happens in indigenous cultures, if a woman gets upset about something during her cycle, the men pick up their ears and go, something's out of balance here or she wouldn't be upset. What do we need to do to correct it? That's the way men need to respond, not just fluff it off and say, oh, you're just emotional because you're having your period. They need to say, oh, you're telling us something's out of balance. How can we fix it? And this is this is really important because part of the the. The male perspective is progress, always moving forward, always being in a hurry, always controlling, always being in command. And what what men need to understand is this period of time that women go through is all about the opposite of progress, speed, or control. It's about being quiet, going deep, listening to one's true heart self. And what men need to do is is look at that and say, well, maybe I can understand that more deeply if I can try to understand and feel what a woman is actually going through. And I think most men in, in our modern times, they're so busy moving forward, forward, forward at the at the breakneck speed that our societies work at that they don't take that time to simply slow themselves down and try to fit in with what's going on during women's cycles. And men can do that. All they have to do is decide, this is something I can do. This is how I can be supportive. I guess the question that I have for you about that is, do, they, do men have the same opportunity women have uh, with the menstrual cycle to go within? Yes, they, they do. They do. Yeah. They have to create it because society mm. does not allow it. Oh, but wow. it's there. They have to just say, you know, I'm going to create this space for myself. But Valeria, that's true for women now also. Right. Most women, when they have their cycle, just plow through their regular daily routine and yes. ignore it. True. Women are not making any special time for going inward any more than men are. True. So it's a 
it's your problem. Both men and women need to claim that time and say this is important. It's just as important to retreat and regroup as it is to continue forward in progress. And men also are governed by hormonal cycles. It's not it's not simply the land of the female. Men also go through cycles. It may not be on a monthly basis, but the cycles are certainly there. And when men, do you have a thought, Pia? No. When when men go through the equivalent experience of perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause, which is andropause, which in the male condition is called andropause, and men also are governed by their hormonal, cyclical experiences. Men can be in a bad mood for no particular reason. And and if they were to look at how they really feel deeply, they would realize that some of their moods, some of their experiences of outbursts have to do with hormonal cycles. And it's an opportunity to look at what's wrong in their lives when they are experiencing these emotional signals. I didn't know about this, that the man had the... Also, andropause. I never heard of that word before. Yeah, that's equivalent to menopause for women. Yes, it's not, it's not a very yeah. well discussed idea yeah. because um, medical, the medical field doesn't really know as much about andropause as it does menopause. Or, but that's because women have been treated as being sick. Oh, that's right. why right. PMS menopause are treated as an illness mm-hmm. instead natural cycle. Andropause is considered a ah, change of life. Let's have an affair or get a sports car. That's oh, the- God. Yeah. True. Said it. <laughs> the problem is that these, these hormonal changes uh-huh. men and women both go through, if emotions come up during that time, I would love to see both genders look at the other and support each other and say, something's out of alignment here. How can I help make it better? Right. Instead of saying, oh, it's just my hormones, or oh, it's your cycle, or whatever. I want people to start taking responsibility for making changes mm-hmm. that their emotions are signaling need to be made within them. And this, this, yes. has to do, this has to do with cooperation. Modern society is not really very involved in cooperation. Um, competition, greed, many of, many of the things that, that really drive our societies need to become much more in balance. And it, it's interesting that that what's going on on Earth at this time is a movement towards unity. And that that unity cannot take place unless men and women begin it at home, as Pia just explained. And that sometimes I reflect about the timing also in nature, that nature cannot be rushed some people, they don't learn as fast. I try to uh, keep that in mind, too. I think, it's, I think that's really an important idea that you're bringing up. And that's, that's why the idea of compassion comes in, too. Everybody, yeah. everybody is evolving at their own pace. And when you asked the question earlier on at the very beginning of this interview about what, how did, did Pia and Cullen cope with, with how different we were as children or during our lifetimes. And I think it's really important to understand that everybody evolves at a different pace. And when you asked about why do some people remember things before they come to this planet, part of that is is personal evolution because some people are simply further along the evolutionary chain than others. And there's no judgment. There's absolutely no judgment here about that. Because it's, everybody's evolving exactly as they're supposed to on their journey. And right? we're all gonna make it, we're all gonna make it to the same place eventually. However, some of us have had experiences that give us that that knowing that we remember because we've we've had these experiences over and over again and we collect them and just simply remember them. I keep that in mind every time I see my husband. <laughs> saying that everything is PMS and blaming that and uh, not taking responsibility, then uh, 
yeah, I tend to kind of bring the thought to mind, to heart, or it might be just the heart coming to expression and just being compassionate. He just doesn't know. That's nice. Exactly. Good approach, Valeria. Yes. It's a beautiful thing to be in your presence. The first time I cried, I was thinking about today. I mean, I couldn't stop myself. <laughs> it was just so <laughs> emotional, but it was something deeper, something that I felt that was so powerful. It's like tears of joy. It might be with that remembrance, right? Trying to, oh, I remember now. This is it. Yeah, this is exactly. what it is. Exactly. Connection, it's, remembrance. It's, it's being connected to, to a truth that gives us, I mean, it, it could make us cry or it could give us goosebumps. It's <laughs> yeah. one of those. It's one of those situations where we just know deeply in our hearts, whether it's intuition speaking or the heart speaking, that, that there's a deep, deep connection and things like that happen. And I am so happy that that sensitive people are able to go with that feeling and actually experience it, experience it fully. It's wonderful. Yeah, it has been a journey to, to be able to just be, you know, without feeling awkward and ashamed from my own deep understandings about life and just letting them be expressed without fear. Yes. Well, congratulations for being with <laughs> journey. And, and I, I want to say equally to you, we really enjoy our conversations with you because the questions you ask are, are very deep and they're very important. And it's a wonderful way of us expressing what we feel is important through your questions, because your questions are important to you. So this is this is a really wonderful connection that we've developed with each other. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate you saying that, too. It's a, an encouragement to me. So we're almost at the end. I love chapter seven to deep listening that you talk about the power of listening to our own intuition. That's a wonderful chapter, the, the entire book, but I tend to focus on things that call my attention for some reason. So I have a final question for you. I probably asked before, but I'll ask again if I did. But before that, would you like to add anything or read a passage in your book? I would just like to say I invite every single person out there to take a moment to retreat in your own timing when you feel like this is something I want to explore. Give yourself permission to retreat rather than being always in forward progress and discover the benefits, the joys, the creativity, the increased intuition, the dreams, the increased relationship harmony. Discover these things for yourself because it's really a magical way to be and it's been lost because of modern culture. So I would invite each person to rediscover it within yourself and then introduce it to your most significant others and teach your children the benefit of cycles and being in harmony with earth. And, and I would add to what Pia just said, just very, very briefly, that retreat doesn't have to do with natural hormonal cycles only. That retreat could be any time that one feels like they might want to spend a little bit of time with themselves or a little bit more time in nature or a little bit more time in meditation. So Anytime a retreat is welcome, it's helpful in many, many ways and on many different levels. And you asked for a small section in the book, and I would read you this. The most valuable suggestion I can offer is that you slow down, create opportunities to listen deeply, find your own connection to nature and honor it. Reestablish respect for your own inner rhythms and your connection to earth rhythms by going to bed early at night rather than reading or working late, eating when you are hungry rather than at scheduled times, and resting when your body enters into cycles of purification. I implore you to simply begin to notice how life is based on cycles. Yes, I love the nighttime for some reason, and I stay up late, but then I don't wake up sometimes as refreshed as I do when I go to bed earlier. So that shows. And my last question to you is, what are three things about life you wish all of us to know before we leave the body? That we are part of nature and that we need to honor the fact that we are part of nature. 
that we come from the stars and we have a larger experience than our earthly experience, and that consciousness never dies. It is an ongoing, evolving, exciting experience. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I would probably pick that we are all divine sparks of energy. We are all connected and that energy is all around us. Energy makes up everything and energy is intelligent. Energy knows what to do, where to go and what to do. I think those are really important ideas that that could help humanity understand the much bigger picture that, that we're part of. Thank you again for sharing this, what I call loving, healing wisdom. I've been calling healing wisdom these days for some reason. And before we say goodbye, where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? We have two websites. My website, which has Sacred Retreat on it, the book we're discussing, is just my name. It's Pia Orlean, P-I-A-O-R-L-E-A-N-E dot com. And Cullen's and my joint website is Larkma, L-A-A-R-K-M-A-A dot com. And you'll find all of our services, all of our books, all of the articles we've written and the interviews we've done. The calendars that we design. Um, all of those things are on both of our websites. Wonderful. I'll have those both links on your podcast profile. I think I have one, just one for some reason. I don't have your website here, PM. So if you can send it to me, it'll be wonderful. Sure, I'll be glad to. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much again, and we'll talk soon. Bye for okay. now. Thank All you, right. Larry. Bye-bye for now. Thank you. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Pia Orlean and Cullen Smith and their work, please visit piaorlean.com and larkma.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.